You're listening to the Savvy Painter Podcast, episode number 38. Welcome to the Savvy Painter Podcast, the podcast for artists who mean business. Here's your host, Antrice Wood. Hey, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. My guest today is Nathan Fowkes. Nathan is a conceptual artist for the entertainment industry. He teaches life drawing classes, portrait painting, and entertainment design, both online at schoolism.com and in person at LAFA, which is the Los Angeles Academy of Figurative Arts. Nathan has a huge list of movie credits to his name, including The Road to El Dorado, The Prince of Egypt, How to Train Your Dragon, The Legend of Puss in Boots, and of course, Shrek. And Nathan and I actually went to school together at Art Center, although I'm embarrassed to say I cannot remember which class we had together. I'm guessing it was Dwight Harmon's, but with a lack of sleep, paint fumes, and a couple years passing through, I'm really not sure, and all those details are a blur. So Nathan, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to talk to me. Well, Antree's art school is absolutely a blur for me too, but this <laughs> this isn't. So, thank you so much. Yeah, and uh, hello to everybody out there. So, give us. Um, I know a lot of people will be interested in this because I have an audience of people who are both at the beginning stages and still in school. I know from people that I have written me. Could you give a brief rundown of what you did after graduating and how you sort of broke into the entertainment world? Yeah, so in one way, I was very lucky because during art school, and uh, I think you'll be able to back me up on this, it was, uh, it was an interesting time in art school because what was being pushed, at least on the illustration side, which was my major uh, at the Art Center College of Design, it was uh, it was an emphasis on print illustration, which was rapidly dying. I mean, it was dying so fast that uh, within a couple of years of, of graduating, people who had pushed really hard in that direction, I mean, my gosh, there they were with fifty, sixty, eighty thousand dollars in debt. Oof, yeah, ha- uh, yeah, exactly. Having to ten bar, you know, and trying to figure out what to do next. Well, I was very lucky in the sense that I always loved uh, I loved drawing and painting images that had uh, a level of maybe narrative mm-hmm. to them. I always loved that side of thing. And so I got a job uh, with Disney while I was in school in theme park show design. Uh, somebody who oh. knew me, they needed some freelance and I stepped in and it went reasonably well, well enough that they said, hey, you know, when you graduate, we could use a full-time staffer, an illustrator, and we'd welcome you in. I cannot tell you, you know, what I said to them was, well, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll think about it. I mean, you know, what, what's the salary? You right. know, I faked, uh, y- you have to fake that kind of thing on the business side. What I thought inside was, thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you. Because buddies of mine, when we were, you know, getting ready to graduate, they were in that position. I have this much debt. I've got to find a job, you know, and I want to be an artist all at the same time. How's this all going to come together? And so it was, uh, it was a real luck that a, a close friend of mine who was working for this company had recommended me, and I had an in through him. Mm. And so that was a lucky th- side of thing. Maybe I can say to everybody out there, you know, be really nice to people you know, network and have those networks be legitimate friends of yours. Because, yeah, you've got to have skills. You've got to have serious skills to sit down and do the job. But going in cold, I'm sorry. You know, if they're picking you out of a stack of portfolios, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. So, exactly. So, yeah, I had this in. I got that job. It carried through after I graduated, and uh, I was in for another year and a half. And then, once again, a friend of mine had gotten hired at DreamWorks. And they said, hey, you know, we're looking for people. We're looking for people with uh, uh, strong painters who, you know, have uh, an interest in narrative or illustration, illustrative qualities. And this other friend of mine said, hey, you know, uh, I know a guy who might be who we need. And so I got that recommendation, and uh, that was my door into DreamWorks. And so I had these series of kind of the where luck meets opportunity kind of experiences, got into DreamWorks and uh, haven't looked back in animation since then. And that was, let's see, so that would have been 1996 when I started in DreamWorks. 
Wow. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, because we were talking earlier and you said it'd been, you'd been there 15 years. And yeah, that's about right, because I was probably at Disney for about 10, 10 or somewhere between 10 or 12. I need to, I keep saying that, that I need to do the math on it because um, I left and came back. So what you said about the networking, people hate the term networking, and I totally understand. It used to make me cringe, too. So I think whatever you want to call it, that authenticity and staying in contact with people and helping each other out is crucial, especially, I think, in in the art world. I, it seems there are very few artists that... There are some lucky breaks, but I think the majority of the time what happens is people develop relationships and those relationships, um, when they're authentic, turn into recommendations and, and opportunities to get for jobs like, like you had or to get into a gallery. Absolutely. And uh, I agree with you. Well, we got to find a better term than networking because it sounds like one of those kind of business things where you fake being friends with as many people as possible yeah. to create opportunities for yourself. And people kind of think of that when they hear the word networking. It, it reminds me, I did a little work for uh, Blizzard Entertainment uh, since I've been freelancing. And uh, it started out, I first met them, they invited me to go down and do, I, I do a lot of teaching, they invited me to go down and do a workshop with them. Mm -hmm. And so they sent out a little, hey, here's just kind of a, a kind of a what we expect from our instructors, from our workshops. And one of the things they put in there, and this is one of those kind of nonsensical business terms again, uh, they went through, you know, our, our artists like to hear about this and they don't like to hear about that. And, and then at the end it said, never ever use the word synergy. <laughs> I thought that was I thought that was hysterical. So I, I I made a careful point. Yeah, I don't like that word either. So I made a careful point not to use it. Oh, that's really funny because that was uh, such a strong. Uh, I think it just got overused. I think it just got yes, yeah, that kind of nineteen eighties. Yeah, yeah, that's Abs funny. yeah, absolutely. That's funny. So can you tell me then? So after so you've been there, you've been working in the entertainment business for uh, that long and now you've moved into freelance as we talked about earlier before the actual interview started tell me how that transition was for you what are some what was one of the biggest surprises to you after having been in sort of I want to say corporate world that's another wor word that I think we need to find a replacement for but um, sort of the yeah, we're going to put our heads together after this interview, and we're going to come up with a new vocabulary. I think so. I think so. Because I, 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 I'll stumble over words before I say them because I'm trying to find a different way to say it because there's words I just don't like. But back to the point. How was that transition for you, and, and what, were, what was surprising for you? So the, the biggest surprise was the thing uh, that led me to become freelance, and that was uh, – two little tiny bouncing baby boys, my wife uh, and I, we had twins. And, <laughs> you know, the world is filled with twins. There's twins everywhere. It's, it's commonplace. And so I didn't realize how shocking it is to people to have twins, you know, to be the woman bearing twins, to take care of twins. And so we had twins and uh, my wife really needed me at home. And once again, someone who knew me over at Blue Sky Studios and was familiar with my work, they needed some help. Uh, they were launching Rio 2, the second installment of the Rio movie set down in uh, set down in Brazil and the Amazon rainforest. They knew that mm -hmm. I kind of like to do organics and, you know, I love, uh, love waterfalls and trees and jungles. I love sketching stuff like that. And so uh, an art director who knew me over there, they needed some work done. They needed a uh, they needed an inspiration pass, kind of a look of picture. Picture. And so I got that call right around this time, you know, struggling with, with the kids at home and, and bringing some help in. And I just jumped at that. You know, I'd been at DreamWorks for 15 years. It was a fantastic ride. If you want later, you know, I can tell you stories, uh, good and bad, I, I guess. But sure. mostly, almost, almost all good. You know, anytime you have a job, there's the funky side of things. But this opportunity came up. 
right at that time. And I jumped right on that. And it was always going to be a, sh- uh, it was never going to be a long term gig. They needed me to work on this project until all the folks, their art department working on Ice Age, when they wrapped, they were all going to come on. They weren't going to need me anymore because I was working uh, remotely from California and they're out in uh, New York State. So it wasn't ever going to be a long term gig, but it got me out the door and, uh, I'm so happy with how things have gone. I'm so, I cannot tell you how happy I am working from home, keeping my own schedule, working very late at night. And uh, it's one of those never look back kind of situations. That's so great. I love hearing that. I love hearing that you were able to, to do what you wanted to do and to balance that time with your family and time with your newborns and create the job that you that you want and that you love it's I love it, it makes me I so need, happy well thank you uh, I need to also throw out there and I know you know you were Disney for many years and then made the break yourself so yeah I, I love commiserating about it both on the positive and the negative because at the same time I had another great gig after Blue Sky. It was great for a short period of time. Uh, I worked for Digital Domain and they launched a new animation studio. They recruited, heavily recruited people with experience. And I was thrilled to get that phone call as well and worked with a great team. Once again, freelance. That that studio was was built out in Florida and I was telecommuting from there. Well, uh, six months into the gig, I get a phone call from the production designer on the show, and she, her, her voice is shaking. You know, you know instantly that something's terribly wrong. Mm-hmm. And she said, we all went into work this morning, and the studio was padlocked, and we don't know what's going on. They're telling us that uh, it sounds like they've uh, – I think they uh, declared bankruptcy, and, uh, and so I, uh, I'll, I'll give you any information I can get, but – Stop doing what you're doing. I mean, it's it's over. They're not letting people even to their desks into the building, uh. and so uh, uh, and so that happened. And that just turned. It was a great gig with great people, but uh, you know, my my last months of my last month of invoices were never paid. You know, even though I I had to go a little bit on the legal side to pursue that. And at the same time, there were law firms that came after freelance artists. Uh, there, it's it's a longer story than anyone wanted to hear, but there were actually law firms that were going after freelance artists to take back wages they were paid. What? Uh, it's true, uh, claiming that other other concerns were not paid fairly, and so the money had to be recouped and then redistributed fairly. And that got so. If you think it was ugly to lose <laughs> a month's wages and to just you know, have it disappear just like that. Uh, it got even uglier from there, and I had to hire a lawyer. You know, uh, there was absolutely nothing wrong on my end. I did my work. I turned it in. You know, everything was invoiced properly. No one ever suggested that any of the freelance artists did anything wrong. They didn't, and yet this happened. And they so just wanted of, their money back. You, uh, uh, you, you find out that it's. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm a really optimistic guy. I'm optimistic about work. I'm optimistic about people. I'm optimistic about about business and and economics. But you know, there's there's a side of it out there that you cannot escape and you cannot deny. And you just have to expect that sometime uh, sometime something just you know horrible beyond your ability to prepare for, right? And that you never caused sometime in your freelance uh, self business, something like that will happen. You got to put aside a little war chest for that, and you've got to kind point. of, kind of, kind of thicken your skin. Even though you know we're artists, uh, we're exactly the opposite. You know, we're very much you know here's what I do. Please love me. You know, we're very thin skinned people, I think, by our nature, because we want, you know, we do something that we love and care about so much, and we hope that it's appreciated. And that's kind of, to me, the definition of a fairly thin skin. And, uh, and or there, somebody that's to the mm-hmm. wrong person is easy to take advantage of. That's certainly possible, too. So uh, you just got to brace yourself for that side of things. So, yeah, that's a really, that's an interesting point. I don't think that anyone could have, well, I never would have anticipated that digital domain would do that, that they would shut the door and lock people out. That was a horrible, horrible time, and so and it, and it affected so many people. And you're right, there will be things like that that you cannot plan for. So that's a, 
I got a I got a question from somebody recently um, who, if I remember the details correctly, she's been in the military and she's getting ready to retire from the military and has been pursuing art all this time. And so now she's she's kind of thinking like, okay, I want to pursue my art. How do I make the transition from you know something like somewhere? that uh, was sort of taking care of her, that she had health benefits, she had all this stuff lined up, much as you and I did in our previous jobs. And then you're going to kind of like, um, you know, go off on your own. And that is a really scary place to be. I know that I, I was very scared when I did it. So how did you prepare for that, making that leap? When I was in art school, speaking of being thin-skinned, Art school, you know, uh, uh, you and I, you're going through that experience in Art Center where we went to school, you know, at the time. And I think still was a a very acclaimed school, very rigorous, Mm -hmm. and had the reputation that basically, you know, you come in the door and three years later you come back out and you haven't slept, you know, for three years. Uh, And and if, if you do sleep, well, guess what? The person next to you didn't sleep. Yes. And, uh, and, and uh, there's... I, I know that a lot of people get really concerned about you know art as as competition, and I definitely was on and wanted to be on the commercial side, and it is a competition in the sense that you know the place that you want to work for, the kind of work you want to do. There's a stack of thirty portfolios of people who would like to have that job, mm-hmm. and of those thirty, they'll immediately throw out twenty five, and then they'll kind of fight over the last five and pick one or two. And so it is, you know, uh, on, on this side of the business, it, it really is like that. Or fighting, you know, uh, I shouldn't say fighting, but but um, getting gall- getting the gallery space mm-hmm. and getting getting people's eyes in front of the gallery work. So when I got out of school and when I was headed for uh, uh, headed for making work decisions, I knew that I could not be a freelance artist because being freelance would be exactly like being in school. No matter how hard I worked, no matter you know, how much I gave up to get my work done. The next assignment was always going to be hanging over my head and it was going to be Saturday and I want to go out and have some fun, but oh my gosh, that thing's due on Monday and I can't really relax and enjoy myself because I really should be working. Mm -hmm. I knew that if I did that, I knew they would find me face down in the parking lot, you know, five (laughs) years later. Uh, So I I mentioned that these in-house opportunities came up. And that was fantastic because they do take care of you. You know, if you if you have something to bring to the table, something that that a wide audience potentially can appreciate, if you develop that, doors will open for you. And so, uh, you know, if if you if you do your job right, they take care of you and your health insurance and DreamWorks. Oh my gosh, what they did because they wanted to recruit people heavily from Disney and from other I studios. I remember that experience. time. Yeah. You, you better believe it. What did they do? They said, well, we can't keep ex- – we can't exponentially raise salaries. We can't afford that even though we need to draw people over. What can we do? Let's feed people. I know. And so they put out – it was so great. They put out beauti- a beautiful – they put out breakfast every morning. We were morning. so they jealous put out a of you guys. beautiful spread of lunch. I should have – you know, if, if we were if we were closer back then, you know, because we'd gone our separate ways, I, I would have had you over to lunch. <laughs> Uh, or, or just just for bragging, oh yeah, check us out over here. It's so great. And they did, you know, they cut back eventually after. They still do it to this day. They still have a beautiful free lunch for anybody and everybody at the studio. But it was so lavish when they wanted to say, hey, we're DreamWorks, we're the best shop in town. Mm-hmm. Every afternoon at three o'clock, they would put out fresh baked food. Uh, and, and so uh, what do they call the, you know, how fast did I put on 15 pounds? <laughs> I had to, I remember I had to fight, I got it back off, but I remember I had to set up a a program for myself. Uh, And basically what I did was I ate all of that DreamWorks food and it, and it was, it was wonderful. And then that was it for the day. I stopped eating dinner and that was the only way I could survive. (laughs) That was the other reason. The second reason they would find me face down in the parking lot was because of all the desserts and treats. Yeah, exactly. So I know I'm kind of drifting far afield of your question, but the point actually is at that time, I could not have been a freelance artist. I did not have the personality for it. I didn't have the clientele. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the reputation. But 15 years later and, and doing my very best 
And the great thing about DreamWorks was you have some of the best artists in the world sitting in the office next to you. And man, you learn everything you can from them. You look over their shoulder, you know, you ask them. And I got so much out of that. So after 15 years, I had enough of a reputation thanks to those opportunities that there was a clientele out there who was ready for me to be freelance because you know, I, I mentioned I'm a family man. Um, job number one, those boys, and I have a little girl now as, as well. Job number one is those kids have to have good health care. Those kids have to, you know, you, you got to have a roof overhead. And uh, I just didn't want to mess around with that. So I had to wait for the right time when there was a clientele mm. that was ready for me. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah, those are, I mean, you brought up so many things. There's so many memories, too, because I remember that that sort of war between Disney and DreamWorks. Yeah. Um, and they locked us into, they, for us, what they did was they they had us sign these contracts that, that said that we would work for them for like four years and and we couldn't go work for another company, but they paid us really well for it. So it was kind of like this, you know, when you're fresh out of college, like, like you were saying, and I had my art center debt too. I was just like, okay, cool. I can pay off my student loans. I'll stay for a couple of years. Yeah, you hope, you know, those waves, they rise and they crash and they have, you know, over the last, for you and I, over the last 20 years. And you just, you know, you, you hope that that one of those waves that you, you position yourself. So if that wave comes, you can, you can ride it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, that opportunity was was there for you and I back at back at that time, right? And I, but I think also that part of it is just being aware of what's going on and constantly being aware of what's going on in your industry, whether it is, you know, fine art galleries or the entertainment world, of being really conscious of what's happening and what could happen because of decisions that are being made now. And I think anticipating things and sort of, like you said, having that nest egg is, is crucial. It's absolutely true. And can I, th can I throw one more out there? Yes, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe this is just, um, maybe I shouldn't because uh, now I'm starting to think, well, how much bragging am I going to do here? But I did see, you know, some of your questions that you throw out on your website, you know, for artists to consider. You ask about the high points and the low points. And this is a good and a bad thing because I feel like, and I say this a little bit tongue in cheek, but I feel like the high point of my career has already come and gone. And I'm ab absolutely fine with this because I'll tell you what it was. Just to have this one thing happen, you know, if I end up in the gutter, this one thing happened and I can just, I can look back on it. So you go through school as, as an illustrator and you hope that a studio or someone, you know, will, will take interest and it's a hard fight up that tree. But once I'd gone through, uh, gone through DreamWorks and had been there closer to the end and, and had more on the experience side, I got a call from Disney and they said, hey, you know, we know because I do, uh, I love uh, outside of entertainment arts, you know, I started out as I, I feel like a painter. I hope that's true. Mm -hmm. And so I love, you know, figurative portrait that I've, I've always tried to, to hold true to that side of things. So uh, I was doing a lot of teaching on the figurative side locally. And so I got a call from Disney saying, hey, you know, we're looking for someone to teach life drawing to our artists over here, you know, we're, we're familiar with you and your teaching. Well, I was working at DreamWorks at that time still, but you know what? There was absolutely nothing in my contract that said I couldn't teach life drawing. You know, there was absolutely nothing over at Disney in the life drawing class that had anything to do with, hey, here's what we're doing over at DreamWorks. Mm -hmm. And so, it was within the bound of my contract. Well, and Trees, you, you and I worked across the street from each other. Disney, people don't know this. Disney is literally, one of Disney studios is literally kitty corner. Yep. Like literally within a stone's throw from DreamWorks. And so, I got this offer and it was for after hours and I said to myself, why wouldn't I? And so I went over, you know, they gave me a Disney key card and, uh, and taught my classes. And so having hope for so many years to have an opportunity, maybe get noticed by a studio, the high point of my career was I found myself in a position where I could go over and, you know, leave DreamWorks at night, teach my class at Disney. And then in one pocket, I had my Disney key card, let me in the studio anytime, day or night. And in my other pocket, I had my DreamWorks key card. I could get back into DreamWorks anytime, day or night. And so, you know, if I wanted to, 
finished teaching my class 10 o'clock at night. I could go rifle through the snacks over at Disney. And if they didn't have good snacks, I could walk back across the street and rifle through the DreamWorks snacks. And my life will never be better than that. Oh, my gosh. Surrounded by art with a full belly. What else could you ask for? <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. And that was actually going to be my, my next question is what's your proudest moment as an artist? So there you go. Yeah, well, thank you for letting me jump the gun on that. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad that was in the rotation. <laughs> so now let's go to the, to the flip side of that. Um, can you share a story when you encountered a significant setback and or experienced real uncertainty? And what did you take away from that experience? You know, uh, the worst feeling in the world for me, short of something truly terrible happening, but just day to day is being embarrassed about the quality of my artwork. That's just, you know, uh, I I just, I'm so, it's just the worst. And so way back when, and you know, you're, you're in high school and you start out in college and, uh, and at that age, you know, you've you've got a kind of a weird, you've got a weird balance between way too much pridefulness in yourself, and and at the same time insecurity. You know, it's just I think a big part of of that age, your late teens. And so I went to uh, I went to junior college for a little while before I went to art school. And that was a good thing because it kind of gave me a chance to put together an entry portfolio to get into art school. But I had a really great uh, figurative teacher during that time that helped me get off to a good start. And when I went through the program, when we got to the end, you know, we'd stayed with this teacher through the entirety, which was two years, and I'd been with this one particular teacher in figure drawing. And so what he did was we all got a little bit of wall space, and he asked us to put up some work that was representative of the two years that we'd spent and put up some work on the wall. And so I pretty much ignored the representative side of it because I have my pride. And so I just picked out a couple of what I thought, a handful of what I thought were my very best figurative drawings and just put those up because you got to put your best foot forward, right? Mm-hmm. And I've got my pride. So I ignored, I ignored, you know, you kind of wanted to be stepping stones and I just put my very best work up. Well, I put the work up like in the morning and it was going to be on display over in the art building. And uh, that evening, one of my buddies came up to me and said, hey, listen, I was over looking at your your uh, figure drawings. And I said, uh-huh, expecting a pat on the back. And he said, um, I think somebody's messing with you. And I said, what? He said, yeah, I think somebody's messing with you. I mean, the drawings have your signature on them, but I don't think it's your work. It's like really bad. Well, I was horrified. And so I ran, I ran up there to see what was going on. And my teacher to teach me a lesson for not putting it up the way that, that he'd asked for, he'd gone back through, he kept drawings from all of us from the beginning, had stacks of student work. He went back through and picked out a couple of my very first drawings that were just so humiliating (laughs) and he put them up, he put them and they had my signature right on them. And, uh, you know, um, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I learned any lesson out of that other than, you know, do not allow a situation where you don't put your best foot forward. And so uh, there was but nothing But you did I put your do. best foot forward, didn't you? I, I did put my best foot forward, but then these other drawings put it completely into question. You know, well, which is, which is Nathan? Is it these drawings or is it these other drawings? Because there was nothing there that said, hey, this is year one and this is year two. It was just a smattering of bad and passable drawings. So what that pushed me towards was a couple of years later, uh, I had started at DreamWorks and I'd kept the life, you know, despite the entertainment arts, I'd, I'd kept the life drawing going. I wanted, I wanted to get to a certain level in that kind of work, just a certain level of skillfulness and uh, just being able to see and appreciate and get that down. That just meant the world to me. And so I met a really fantastic uh, dynamic duo of artists named Scott Burdick and Susan Lyon. Mm-hmm. A married couple, they are so good. Well, Scott Burdick, we were working on a show called Spirit Stallion of the Cimarron. And Scott did beautiful kind of Western landscape painting. We hired him to do some inspirational work for the film. So I got to know them. 
and they're fantastic at portrait and figurative work. And, and so I asked both of them, I said, hey, you know, you guys pretty much have this down and I wasn't up to their level. And I said, you know, what do you feel like tipped the balance for you? And Scott said, you know, we studied at the Palette and Chisel. Uh, we studied under Richard Schmidt and then some, some other teachers that he mentioned mm-hmm. uh, at the Palette and Chisel in Chicago. And he said, for three years, we came in every day at nine o'clock. We drew until noon. We had lunch noon to one. We came back and we painted from one to four and we had dinner. And then we came back again at seven and did it again from seven to 10 PM every day, five days a week. Plus we got out and did some landscape sketching on the weekends. And we did that solid for three years. What I did, I vowed to do this. And I did this at that moment. When I finished working on Spirit Stallion of the Cimarron, I set up a six-month sabbatical with DreamWorks. I'd go away for six months, completely unpaid. I'd saved up my money, and I did have a contract to come back, and that was a good feeling. And for six months, 9 to 12, 1 to 4, 7 to 10, five days a week, and then six to eight hours of landscape painting on Saturdays. And then, you know, you need a day off. I, I took Sunday, you know, to, to actually have a life. And uh, I did that for six months. Uh, and I vowed, you know, back when, back, and this is just one little example, but this teacher, you know, I felt so embarrassed and wanted to get just, you know, I wanted it so bad, my teeth ached to get to a higher level. Mm-hmm. And so I could have made some real money during that six months. And uh, in hindsight, man, there's no possible way I could ever regret that period. It tipped the balance for me and created, I mentioned this opportunity to teach life drawing over at Disney. That one six-month sabbatical tipped the balance to create an opportunity like that one. That's a great story, Nathan. I love it because it shows so much the dedication and just the sheer willpower to go out and do what you want and to realize that you have to work so hard for it and and make the time to do it. It's really, I mean, that's really powerful stuff because I think a lot of times, I'm guilty of this too sometimes, so this isn't any anything that, um, you know, like shame on you, people who are listening, you haven't done what Nathan has done. Um, but it's kind of human nature. You really, really want something, but there's, you don't want it bad enough to to do what it takes to make the sacrifices and and there's a certain amount of brutal honesty i think that um is needed to be able to say like this is something that i need to do it's going to cost me xyz and i'm not talking about money i'm talking about it could be money but it could be just other things that you are going to do things that you want to do going out with your friends like you're saying and just saying like okay this is what i'm going to do and that's a serious dedication and discipline to be able to do that. It's absolutely true. And, and you know, I can, I can tell you, you know, we, we look to people that we admire and, and try and get some cues from what, we, what they do, you know, try and figure out how can I make this happen for me. And for instance, I'm a huge fan of James Gurney. You know, the Dinotopia guy mm-hmm. did this series of books, Dinotopia, and uh, just, just one of the great living illustrators and works traditionally. You know, he comes from... Um, he's he's not an old guy, but you know he he comes from just kind of one step before you and I were you know pre digital age, and uh, James Gurney says, well you know I, I don't own a TV set, I have other things to do, right. and I was listening to uh, an, an an artist speak. Uh, I was listening to an artist speak named Feng Zhu, who's a famous conceptual artist for video game design. And he said, you know what? He said, I actually don't play video games. He said, sure, I mean, I play them because I have to know, I have to be familiar with them. So he said, when each new game comes out that that might impact my work in some way, I go ahead, I get the game. You know, he has all the platforms. He gets the game. He says he plays it for half an hour to get the feel of what the game is, and he knows he keeps current. And then he puts it away, and he's not a gamer. He does not play you know, for the hours and hours that right. gamers enjoy playing. There's nothing wrong with the video games. They're fantastic. I'm in favor of it. But this is one of the guys who works on a level higher than most other people. Right. And, you know, the, the definition of a sacrifice is giving up something that's really good in favor of hoping to get something that's even better. And people like these two people, James Gurney, Feng Zhu, um, that's a sacrifice that they've made. Mm-hmm that's allowed them to get up to that higher level. And if you don't mind me throwing one more out there, because it just pop, pops to mind, it kind of helps us, helps us think about, you know, early on, if anyone out there is a student, you know, thinking about making the commitment. There was a, uh, 
early in college, before I went to art school at this this other uh, program that I went through for a couple of years, they had guest artist speakers come in, and so they filled their auditorium, you know, with all the uh, uh, all the different art department people. And this guy came and spoke, a commercial illustrator, and uh, he first off he said, okay, he said, uh, how many of you in this group? And mind you, everyone here is an art major in college. He says, how many of you are certain that you want to be a professional artist? I'd say maybe half, a little more than half of the people raised their hand. And he said, okay, he said, uh, for those of you who did not raise your hand, you know, you're welcome to stay. I love you. I'm sure you're a wonderful person, but you will never be a, you will never be a professional artist because the commitment that's required and the sacrifices that have to be made to work on a level where those opportunities actually happen for you. It takes a level of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And if you're not 100%, you know, if you are not certain that you're on board, then it's just not going to happen. And that I was, I was glad I did raise my hand and I was very <laughs> glad I raised my hand. And it kind of, you know, kind of set the stage and made you really think, you know, uh, I've, I've got to, I've, I, this is all or none. And uh, that's the decision that has to be made. Right, right. Yeah, and it takes um, self-awareness, I think, too, of realizing that that almost every choice you make of how you spend your time is a choice. Is a choice of, are, am I going to be working on my art right now, or am I going to go do X, Y, Z? And sometimes we make those choices, I think, without really thinking about it. There are certain things that I think people. You know, just like, okay, I'm just going to watch TV for a half an hour. I'm just going to j- jump on Facebook for 20 minutes. And, you know, two hours later, you're still sitting there and you're making, whether it's conscious or not, you're making a choice not to be the high performer, not to to push yourself and to push your craft, whatever that is. Yes. And, you know, I always feel like, as I have to, I have to be careful, whenever... Whenever I point a finger out there and, and tell everyone, you know, work harder and, and I try and be a good example and everything, you know, you learn the hard way. You've always got to point a finger back at yourself uh, when you try and put yourself up on a pedestal. And the other extreme, and it's, it's one of the dilemmas uh, for artists and definitely for me too, I, I have that feeling where, man, I've, I've always got to be on it. I've always got to be uh, – I've always got to have a project. I have to be making progress. And so, for instance, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lucky guy in, a, in, in way too many ways. You know, um, I, I have some of the best parents in the world, and, and my gosh, these people are saints. You know, growing up, basically, the, the attitude we are grown up with was – you know, get over yourself and take this lasagna over to so and so. You know, the Joneses, who, whose mom is holed up in the hospital. Mm-hmm. You know, that's kind of kind of upbringing I had. And when we do this, you know, it's easy to get so wrapped up in yourself and oh, I'm an artist and it's what I do. You know, and and every waking, every free moment that doesn't have to be spent doing something else, you know, has to be with this. And that's one of the big dilemmas for me. Now, I married a saint, and she does take lasagnas over to people who are holed up in the hospital, <laughs> and so that helps. But, you know, I, I, I can't be this, uh, you know, I, 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 I can't be this, uh, you know, this, this jerk all by himself, you know, kind of basking in his glory all alone in a dark room all day, every day. You know, that, that becomes the other side. Of the dilemma, absolutely, and I think um, one of one of the artists that I interviewed, Tom Whittle, talked about um, <clears throat> about that dilemma, and his take on it was really that you you have to take care of everything else too. I mean, like it or not, you you have to. It's just making it a conscious choice of what you're doing. I guess is my point, and and what and just to, as a as a side note, every most of the things, everything that I talk about, I should say comes from personal experience. So when I say you're making a choice to be on Facebook an hour or two hours instead of doing your artwork, Mm -hmm. I know that because I experienced that. So I am not a saint. (laughs) Um, But getting back to the point of of taking care of the the people around you, you, all of those things help you do your art because you if you're if your twins, if your daughter are not taken care of, you cannot focus on your art. There's no way. It's true. So, and if your and if your wife is unhappy, you can't do your art because you you can't focus on it. You can't be present in it because you're thinking about it. So you have to have all of your, you know, like you can't, as we're saying, you can't 
put yourself in a vacuum and lock yourself in a room and only do art because everything if everything else falls apart then you fall apart it's it's absolutely true and um the the tortured artist thing it's it, it's a good thing in the sense that the torture is that you're just desperate to be better than you are and that you know and and uh, you've you've seen you've seen what's been accomplished and how some of these great artists have have inspired and communicated you know and and it can potentially make you feel so small you know and the 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 torture comes from having such high hopes but as far as torture meaning you're a miserable person <laughs> to be around well guess what it's exactly it's exactly the way that you put it yeah yeah it's yeah and it's it's tough it's hard it's not easy because there's it's we're so dedicated to our craft we're so dedicated to getting better and we're human beings so we're impatient we want everything right now and you know you have to slow down and again I'm talking to myself you know slowing down and really um giving yourself the time that you need to develop and and creating the life that you want without leaving other people behind because it's you know they're the ones supporting you and one of my uh, one of my pushes, and this is hard to do, especially working from home. But you know, I've kind of worked things out and made arrangements to make it happen. We have to get into uh, a position where we can get into that state of flow. You mm-hmm. know, where the distractions go away, and one has been at this for fifteen, twenty years, sometimes even longer, and kind of created those pathways in your brain and, and those experiences and create a situation where uh, there aren't things eating at you or distracting you. And so you get in a state of focus where th- th- those experiences click into place and then you're able to work at a little bit higher level mm-hmm. than otherwise. And if you have distractions, if you have things that are eating at you, that that level of flow where you are your very best self, your best artist yeah, that level of flow is really going to be compromised. Exactly. Very well put. So, Nathan, tell me what um, what are you working on right now? What is your what are you currently obsessed with? I, I got uh, got lots of things going on. That's one of the nice things about freelance. Though also the frustrations. You have lots of things going on, and it feels like you're spending all day emailing people, invoicing, you know, and mm-hmm. uh, and doing the business side of things. So that's the other frustration. But um, I've been doing a lot of work uh, with Disney uh, off and on. Uh, uh, while I've been freelancing, I have a relationship with some game design companies, and they're getting game design companies are getting really interested in people with animation experience because we've we've dealt with like full color, full lighting, and using and, and this is what I'm all about: um, color design, lighting design, and pictorial composition. Those are the oh. things in art that I love the most. Live for those things. Yes, and in, yeah, and uh, animation has allowed, you know, uh, allowed me to focus on those things. Well, in game design, you know, they've had big limitations in resolution and quality of rendering and the a, the level of coloring and lighting that they've done. Yeah. But now the yeah, the technology is uh, at a place where they're almost caught up in real time with what, you know, pre-created animation can do. And so they've been interested in bringing people over f- with animation experience, with experience in theatrical color design, lighting design, oh, how exciting. Uh, concept art. And so, yeah, so I have a uh, relationship with those people as well. And my other big push uh, that I'm just thrilled about, because I'm a teacher and uh, and and really – enjoy that side side of it as well but I don't have the time to teach that I did before you know married and three kids later well online teaching uh, you you can don't tell anyone you know everyone turn off your turn off the podcast for the next few seconds but you know you can sit in your you can sit in your pajamas in, in your dark studio and teach teach from home in front of your computer you know and 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 just tell everyone oh yeah you know i'm I'm wearing a i'm i'm wearing a nicely pressed shirt right now and you know but so i've uh i've been on the online teaching side i've partnered with a group of people at imaginism studios some of the best people that i've ever worked with uh and they have we have we have an online school it's created by them and i've partnered with them teaching a series of classes called schoolism schoolism Mm schoolism.com and i've I've also been kept the life drawing uh going i'm teaching life drawing online of all things and you mentioned yeah you mentioned lafa the la academy of figurative art i still teach for them and we have some online stuff as well uh we do uh 
uh, it's artschoolvideos.com where I have some online uh, material and classes with them. So right now I have a student, I have a couple of students in Bulgaria, I have a couple of students in Brazil, I have a couple of students in Europe, all over the United States, Canada. We haven't gone into Asia yet because of piracy problems. Uh. Uh, but, but, you know, to touch and, and interact with people from all over the world is an opportunity that never occurred to me or, or thought I might have. So that's, uh, you know, great time to be alive. Isn't there has it? never been. And you're doing, um, uh, everyone knows where you're living now. Is that right, Entries? I mean, I don't want to give out personal information about you, yeah. but you live in a very different part of the world than I do having moved from, having moved away from Los Angeles. And here you are doing a fantastic podcast. You know, I've been, I've been listening and, uh, and, you know, you, you, you could be next door. You could be on the other side of the world. You're in contact with artists all over the world. It doesn't matter where you live. It's never been a better time to be alive, especially as an artist. I know, and I find that so exciting and invigorating. I mean, think about it. We, You and I were both really lucky in the fact um, that we were in, you know, we went to school at a great school in Southern California where all the entertainment studios are. Most of them are... So I feel like we had this really different experience of com- coming of age as an artist than most people do, because there were so many opportunities when, when we graduated, I felt like. I felt like you could do anything, right? The, mm-hmm. Just at the time that we were graduating, the web kicked in. And so things like Disney Interactive and and Warner Interactive and Linda Weinman was teaching at Art Center there before she started lynda.com. I had a bunch of classes with her. And Mm. that sort of like, for me, was a pivot of, of, wow, everything that they've taught us in terms of doing editorial illustration, book illustration, children's book illustration, or there's this whole other thing that you can go into with entertainment design and all this stuff. And now you've got students from Bulgaria and and you can give them the same kind of opportunities I think that that we had like I see it now from living here in Argentina that you know there's a lot of people who are studying art that just don't have the access to people and now they do. I mean you can you can people can connect with you through social media or they can take classes with you wherever they are and that's so magical to me. Yeah. Absolutely. That opportunity that existed for some of us, you know, back then now potentially exists for everyone. And at the same time, it's kind of, it's a big responsibility. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and for you too, I'm going to put it on your shoulders entries <laughs> in, instead of mine, okay. because, you know, we, we were in Los Angeles, there were opportunities there. And when I started at DreamWorks, I had two months where they were just training training to bring everyone up to speed on what they wanted to do mm-hmm. with our first show the prince of egypt and i had some of the i had a couple of the best artists in the world uh training me oh my gosh and that you know that was a very isolated thing yeah and now you know um uh with you teaching through your podcast with myself reaching out uh reaching out as a teacher online it's uh it, it's our job to to Give you know help with those opportunities, uh, any place in the world where where people are looking for them. Yeah, yeah. I feel like it's a, you know in a way it's just it's an honor. I love it. I mean, I I don't I get so much out of doing this, and I feel like um, as you were saying, I'm here in Argentina. You're there in Los Angeles. It's almost like borders have been erased. I mean, artists. You know, it's such a great time to be an artist. It's so it's there's so many opportunities. At least the way I see it. Yeah, and uh, did you uh, did you ever have Bern Hogarth? Yep. In uh, yeah, um, <laughs> I don't know. Different people had different opinions, but for people who didn't know Bern Bern Hogarth, he basically he was fantastic. I love that this, man. Oh man! So he was um, Bern Bern Hogarth, and are, are we good for time? Can I tell a Bern Hogarth tell, story? Yes, I would love to hear a Bern Hogarth story. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So if, for people who aren't familiar, he had this series of books: dynamic every, dynamic head drawing, dynamic figure drawing, dynamic drapery, yeah. dynamic Hands. you know spill. Yeah, dynamic spilled milk. He was the dynamic guy, and he he uh, he had done the 
original Tarzan comic, like back in the 1930s, uh, when I had him, he was 83 years mm-hmm. old, and he would storm around <sighs> that classroom. You're, I'm saying this for the audience because you know he would storm around the classroom. He would shout at people. He would throw chairs across the room. <laughs> 83 years old, this guy. Well, it, I thought it was fantastic. You know, to me, it was all theatrics. It and was he, theatrics. He, he admitted as much. Like he would say at the end of class, he would say, he'd say, same time, same place, same show uh, at the end of class. You know, he was putting on a show for everyone. But I stayed that after class. That was probably class the class ta- that we had together. It could, have, could well have been. Because, uh, yeah, I had it I had a, for a couple of them. Um, I stayed after class one time to go over something with him. There was a, a woman in, uh, in front of me. And uh, and she's talking to him. She said, "Listen, um, I, I know this is a tall order, but I just wanted to to talk to you because I really don't want to have to leave the class, but I might." She said, um, I, "I came from a situation where I had an abusive dad, and uh, and I just can't take the class." The way that it is, you know, she was very. I, I thought she was classy the way she brought it up. She said, "I know it's, I know it's my problem. I, I don't want to have to transfer out. I, I can't take this. Is this really what the class is?" And he actually, he, he was very kind. He was very soft spoken, but he said, "You know, I, I, have, I have a certain way of teaching. I, I do it for specific reasons. You know, and and that's uh, that's what my class is. I support you staying and hope you will. But if you if you're uncomfortable with it, I absolutely support. And you know." I, I support you. I, no hard feelings if you feel like you can't take the class. And it was amazing to see him go from rampaging around the room to he became the kindly father, mm-hmm. you know, in, in that moment. Someone asked me about Bern Hogarth this was a while back. They asked me, they'd heard stories about him. I told him some of those things. And they said, uh, they said, well, then how are you as a teacher, you know, if Bern Hogarth was so great? And I told him what we just said. I said, well, you know, I consider my job. Uh, uh, Bern Hogarth is not around anymore. In fact, I'll just throw it very brief, but I'll throw in because it's such a nice, it's such a wonderful end to his story. Uh, Bern Hogarth, one year after you and I graduated, he went out to Paris to receive a Lifetime Achievement Award. I don't know if you you know this, you you may well, Mm -hmm. but he went out to Paris for a Lifetime Achievement Award and received the award, big banquet, the whole thing. And he passed away in his hotel room the next day. Oh my God, and I didn't realize that that's when he passed away. I knew, wow. If, if I can go out, you know, vigorous into my mid-80s, get a Lifetime Achievement Award, and then go out in a blaze of, I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, one, one can only hope. So, you know, this, this, uh, this person I was talking to when I was kind of waxing eloquent, you know, waxing about the old days, Bern Hogarth, he said, well, you know, so, so what, how, how are you as a teacher? Because he said... Uh, uh, he's gone, so it's your job to be the Bern Hogarth, you know, to the up and coming generation. Man, I haven't quite been able to do it. I, I've I've learned. I'm getting better. Uh, you know, when you're a dad, you have to learn how to t- put on that stern face, even if you don't feel it. You have to kind of give you know give your kids. Right. That look. They laugh at me. They know they can't. I give them that look, and they know it's a put on, and they just laugh at me. But I'm getting better. You know, my students. Oh yeah, I didn't get my homework done. You know, I'll give them that. I'm so disappointed in you. And, and that's I. So I can't quite go full burn Hogarth, but I'm really good at the I'm so disappointed in you. That's really funny. That's a great story. He was, yeah, it was, I'll tell you real quickly my burn Hogarth story is that he was, uh, that was absolutely an act because I, luckily for me, for my personality, if, if I hadn't had this experience, I would have been absolutely terrified of him. But I used to work, I did the work study program. So I used to come into Art Center a couple of hours early and set up all the classrooms and set up the models. And I started doing that first term. So I got to know Byrne really well because I would go in and set up his classes and he would be there and I would get to hang out and talk to him for about an hour while I set and I would always take a very long time to set up his class (laughs) because I could just hang out with him and and talk and he was just this like the sweetest man and and I had heard all these people talk about Byrne and how tough he was. It was amazing to me when I finally did uh, get into his class and he would yell at people. He would like he would come up behind you and and you know he just I remember him coming up behind me and saying you know make her pretty god damn it you know and the model yeah. just looking at me and looking at him going what is on your paper what are you doing to me. <laughs> 
Yeah. Or, or another one was uh, he would stare over your shoulder like he would stand there and you'd start to feel more and more uncomfortable waiting for what was going right. to come out. And then finally, after you're just sweating bullets, he would shout something out like, if I had a foot like that, I'd take it to the hospital <laughs> and storm around to the next person. <laughs> Yeah, it was a total act, though, because honestly, that I spent three years setting up his classroom. He's a big teddy bear, and I still can't talk about him in the past tense. So he's still he's still very much alive in my head. Yes. Very very cool. Tell me, um, what are you reading right now? What books would you recommend? I do not recommend art. Actually, I only recommend one art book, and that's my problem. It's not that there aren't great resources out there, but um, I'll go ahead since the expectation is to throw an art book out there. I, I've been so frustrated for so long. Uh, one of the big things for me and for artists, color and light. Mm-hmm. And the, the resources that have been out there are so – have been so there's, – there's good information out there. There are good lectures. There's good articles. There are chapters in books that are all fantastic. But – it's been kind of shocking how either there's fantastic theories that aren't applied pract- practically speaking for ordinary people like like you and I, or there's been uh, kind of you know kind of formulaic kind of formulaic serving up things like a recipe out there. Mm-hmm. Well, I really love. We mentioned James Gurney earlier. Uh, his book, uh, uh, Color and Light. Uh, fills that gap because he is so scientific and so artistic at the same time that that's the book recommendation that I will definitely throw out there because I'm kind of shocked. Uh, I have a lot of students, you know, people take follow-up classes, they've been through art school, and I find that there are many of them who come out of art school and if you give them a sphere, here's a here's a green sphere, and we're gonna shine, uh, we're gonna shine an orange light on that green sphere. Show me what color the highlight would be, and they have absolutely no idea. And that's something that they. It's like your multiplication tables. You should have learned that in grade school. You know how we hear about uh, in sometimes in some places there'll be a high school district where they'll test graduating students and say, oh my gosh, it turns out that. 50% of them can't do their basic multiplication tables. Isn't it terrible? Mm-hmm. Well, that's my experience with the design of color and light coming out of a lot of art schools. The same kind of, this is foundational people. How did this happen? And so this is a resource that helps bridge a gap like that. But so uh, now that we've got that out of the way, I am a science fiction fanatic. Oh, that's what I read. Let's hear it. Sure, yeah, I've, I've, I've read, yeah, I, you know, I forced myself to read the classics. They were great and everything. But um, you, you take, there's this rare breed of person who is a PhD legitimate scientist, astrophysicist. It turns out they also love literature, studied it, a wonderful writer, literary, great storyteller, an artist with words. And so they combine hard science with fantastic storytelling, fantastic characters. It's kind of the space opera, hard science fiction genre. Mm-hmm. I, I live for that because, you know, in my life, I will never see the far reaches of the universe. You know, we get little glimpses with these amazing telescopes that are out there. But I will, you know, there are things out there. Uh, there uh, each galaxy has something like 500 billion stars in it on average. Ours has something like 400 billion. And there are more galaxies in the universe than there are grains of sand on a beach. They're an order of magnitude of trillions. There are things out there in distant corners of the universe that are beyond our imagination. But there are people out there who are positioned to give us a little glimpse of what it could be with great, you know, with great human storytelling at the same time. And I just, I'm not happy unless I have one of those novels laying around. Right now, I'm, one of my favorites is an, uh, a writer named Alistair Reynolds uh, out of the UK. Great space opera. He was a space scientist with the uh, uh, European Space Agency for many years, and thank goodness he made the break and became a full-time writer. So I, I've just finished a book of his called On the Steel Breeze. Um, part of a series and uh, it's just it just couldn't be more fantastic couldn't be more fun to read wow wow that's a very good um uh, you're making me want to pick up science fiction now yeah science fiction <laughs> and art it's sci- science and art it's all uh you know they they're connected. maybe they're they're kind of like they're opposite sides on a scale that definitely weave into each other beautifully 
What is your dream project? If there was no restrictions on time or money, what would you create? That is an excellent question. You know, I in my head, I'm always doing the Prince of Egypt better because that was that was back then the prince of egypt was the dream project um big epic landscapes you know big drama Mm -hmm. um uh, theatrical kind of a little bit of that 19th century storm clouds uh light falling passages of light falling across the landscape and not in others characters larger than life you know epic um uh epic pharaohs making monuments to themselves you know that are that are that are bigger and better than you know what i can conceive sitting in my little you know sitting in a dark room here in in my studio uh and so and it was such a great starting out project and I was in a learning curve. So, you know, I was the new guy. And in my mind, I'm always wanting to do another The Prince of Egypt. You know, not The Prince of Egypt, but... but something but, epic. But something that, um, you know, you... You you go in the movie theater and you feel like like happens in a really good movie. You go in the movie theater and you have this experience and you, you come out a new person with a fresh look, uh, a fresh look on life. You know, something that just... That's that's so big and so present and so immersive that you come out of it. And all, all personally, I'll never achieve that. But that's, it's, it's kind of this funny thing. On one hand, you have uh, kind of the lone genius artists, and there are some of them, you know, and all by themselves, they come up with, they come up with just stuff that no one else could have come up with. That it's rare, but, but those people exist. The other extreme, though, is kind of the, the basic human endeavor. You know, whether... Uh, uh, whether you're a tribe of people who has to be so extraordinarily skillful that you have to take on the uh, the worst that planet Earth can, you know, you have to outdo the top predators that Earth has ever seen. Mm. You have to be so skillful, so committed that you're a tribe of people who can outmaneuver that to being a tribe of people who put a man on the moon or a tribe of people who are so skillful and determined and collaborative that they put out a great movie, and you know, all of those things uh, require uh, individuals with niche skills that, who are able to collaborate with each other, and something far greater comes out of it. I want to, uh, I want to keep doing that. I, I want to keep having projects uh, that force me to to reach a little higher and stand a little bit taller as an artist and be a part of something like that. That was an amazing answer, Nathan. I love that. That was a beautiful picture you just painted. Thank you. I feel like I should end it right there. Like, I don't know what better we could go out on. <laughs> Yay. I, hopefully I said something. <laughs> I, I may have actually said something that uh, that the audience might uh, might go in for. So that, that's my goal with uh, the opportunity to have this chat is I hope there's something in there that uh, at least uh, is, is interesting for people to you know, hear about the good old days and the good things to come. Yeah, fantastic. Nathan, thank you so much for spending this time with me. It was such a pleasure to talk to you again. And Trees, thank you. It has been absolutely my pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Savvy Painter podcast. Look for the show notes for this episode at SavvyPainter.com forward slash 38, where you can see Nathan's work and find links to everything that we've talked about. And I have a quick favor. If you've been enjoying this show, please consider leaving a review for me on iTunes. Those reviews help other people find the show, and it also helps me get the great guests for you. I am so grateful that you choose to listen to the Savvy Painter podcast. Please know that my inbox is always open to you. I really enjoy hearing from my listeners. I do this for you, and your comments and suggestions have really helped shape this podcast. So I want to thank everyone who has been sending me messages. I love hearing from you. Until the next time, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter Podcast. <laughs>